Just ahead on American Black Journal, I'll talk with black business owners about the importance of building a legacy and wealth for the next generation. Plus, a new bus tour traces Detroit's African American history. Don't go away. American Black Journal starts now. American Black Journal is funded by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Maryland cabinets, and their brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Ford has a long history of honoring the achievements of great men and women. We also recognize that honoring means ensuring their legacies are carried forward. 2018 marks the 50th anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination. To continue his legacy, Ford is partnering with the King Center and encouraging everyone to perform 50 acts of kindness. Between now and August 28, go to mlk54.org and register your act of kindness. Add Ford in the group name as Ford will recognize select actions from our Southeast Michigan community. Perform your simple act of kindness and together we'll carry forward Dr. King's dream of creating a beloved community. American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. Research shows that legacy planning within black-owned businesses lags behind that of other cultures. Unlike Jewish, Asian, or Caucasian business owners, African Americans are less likely to pass the baton to the next generation. My first guests today are defying that trend. Bernard White is the founder of White Construction. A new book traces his company's legacy as one of the nation's largest African American-owned construction companies. His oldest son has now taken on a leadership role in the business. And James and Elizabeth Mays are a father-daughter team heading up MCS Multimedia, formerly known as Mays Printing. The company was originally founded by James's father, Jay Calton Mays. All of you, welcome to American Black Journal. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so let's start with this idea of passing the baton uh, from one generation to the next and why that's less likely to happen uh, with, with African American businesses. It's very important, as you know, Stephen, uh, you know, as you may know, <clears throat> only about 30% of the companies are passed to the second generation and maybe about 10% are passed to the, the, uh, the third generation. So my goal is to pass it on to my son, Donovan White, who's 38 years old. He's been working in the company for 20 years. He's doing a great job. He's gotten a great deal of experience. Just came off the new um, Little Caesars Arena uh -huh. in, a, in a leadership role. So I'm doing everything I can to support him going forward so he can uh, you know, keep the company going. But I'm beginning to rest, but I will still be, be there to help support him and lead him. Uh, in addition to that, to uh, support my legacy, I've, uh, I've penned the book White Construction, An American Story, built in Detroit. Uh, the Mage Printing Company, of course, printed the book, and also <laughs> Don James was our writer. And, and the reason why I did this was to, to document our history. It's a pictorial representation of all the uh, various projects that we've had uh, an opportunity to work on in the city of Detroit over the last 29 years. And I think a lot of people will be very surprised to see some of the things we've worked on. And I did it because I wanted to make sure I didn't depend on Google and or Wikipedia to tell us, you know, what white construction <laughs> tell is. tell your story. Exactly, right? in 15 or 20 years. And hopefully some, some kid, African American, uh, male or female, may look at it and, uh, and, and become inspired such they could pursue their dreams after reading my story as to what I did to get where I was. So yeah. I'm very proud of that. And in fact, you can, you can purchase a book on the, uh, the www.educationfoundation.org website. Uh -huh. It's for sale for 55 bucks, and all the proceeds go to the W. Bernard White Education Foundation. And we, uh, we typically uh, support uh, African-American students, male and female. Last year, we gave $10,000 uh, to uh, 20 students at LTU, male Excellent. and female. 
and so they could uh, buy books at the bookstore, et cetera. And they were very, very pleased with it. It really did more for me to help them out uh, than it probably did for them. So yeah. I'm very proud of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so talk about yeah. the father-daughter team, how important <laughs> that is, and, and whether that uh, is the key to, I guess, making sure that the business stays in the family. Yeah. Okay. Uh, back in 1946, my father was a Tuskegee Airman. Uh -huh. uh, after he was discharged from the United States Army Air Force, he, he migrated to Detroit, mm -hmm. Michigan, where he started the uh, Mage Printing Company. Um, my father always said it, when he came to Detroit, uh, he started his business on the back of a streetcar. He would ride from Jefferson all the back, all the way to Eight Mile Road, uh -huh. and that was his office. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that works, right? Yes. Uh -huh. And what he always told me is that I'm building this company for you, for you, yeah, and my children, and my children's children. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Okay. And he delivered on the actual promise. He sent all of his children. To college, yeah. pay for him himself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the back of a print shop, <laughs> uh, sitting tight by hand and working all day and night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. By saying that, I continue the actual promise that my father gave me. Yeah. And I pass the torch over to all five of my children, and they all have college degrees. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and that's uh, kind of a first step, right? You can't really pass the business on easily uh, to people who them. who are not ready to run it. Right. 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 Yeah. right. Yeah. Now, what my father used to always say, it, and people used to ask him, uh, "How did you get your son to join the business?" Yeah. He said, "I did not deny my son his childhood." Huh. I let him play baseball, yeah, yeah. go to the YMCA, swim, Boy Scout, <laughs> Cub Scout, like, etc. So when the decision came, I made it on my own. You did it on your own. That's mm -hmm. interesting. And was not forced. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, Which is important. Did you experience that same thing? You know, it's so crazy. Um, yes and no. So yeah. I definitely grew up in the family business. Um, as a child, I remember, you know, listening to the presses run, um, seeing my father and my grandfather <laughs> handle business and, you know, take care of their staff. Um, so when I was in college, I actually went to school for film. Mm -hmm. And um, oh. in the midst of me being in my um, second year of college, my father said, get a degree in printing. And I'm like, well, why? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, because you never know when you might need it. So I listened and I took my degree. So when I graduated from college, my father was telling me that it was time to pass the business over. And um, luckily I was prepared. Yeah. Um, I grew up, you know, pretty fast. My mom had lost her sight when I was a little younger. So I kind of um, took on like a lot of adult responsibilities mm -hmm. um, at that time, which kind of was slowly but surely molding me. Um, and of course, being in the operation and knowing what it's like the day to day, um, you know, taking over the family business really wasn't even a hard decision. Mm -hmm. And luckily I did have my degree in it. So I had knowledge. Right. You know, a lot of right. children go straight into the family business um, and may not necessarily have any book knowledge. They only have kind of, I don't want to say street knowledge, but they've you know, in shop, the business, they've right. seen it. But it, it, took it, it took me to another level um, to really understand the education behind it. And I'm glad that I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad that I did. So he definitely prepared us. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, I, I know you, uh, you know this uh, because of the industry you work in, but um, I, I feel like the city would be a different place if more African-American businesses were able to extend that legacy further. I mean, you think of the opportunities in construction, for instance, think of all the stuff we're doing mm -hmm. uh, in the city right now and that we talk about participation all the time. Yes. That would be an easier question to solve if there were more businesses that had, had maintained that, that legacy. Mm -hmm. there, there are quite a few African-American owned businesses in, in the city of Detroit uh, and I know quite a few construction mm -hmm. uh, related subcontractors uh, prime contractors have done very well. And, and I should say that, you know, over our 29 year history, we've, we've had a lot of and enjoyed a lot of support from the city of Detroit under the shelter sure. market program, yeah. um, uh, executive board of number four. A lot of that has been, uh, you know, dismantled now, if you will, yeah. for yeah. Uh, under proposal uh, two and passed in 2006, there's, you can no longer have any race or gender-based uh, right. contracting or education 
uh, things going on. So it's going to be a little bit hard. And I told my son he's probably not going to enjoy the same opportunities that I've enjoyed. That you did. Huh? Uh, but uh, hopefully he will continue to do well based on the, the fact that we've done a great job over the years and we've uh, developed a great reputation. Yeah. Um, when was the first time you remember uh, your dad just even raising the idea that uh, that this was for you was it in college or was it, it was in college that? when he told me to get the degree yeah. you know and I'm so like, he hadn't really talked about it before. no he hadn't really talked about it before because you know he was running the operation uh -huh. and you know doing a you know a fantastic job at that so when I did graduate from college and I started to actually work a little bit more in the family business more full-time because I didn't have to be in school um, I think he started to see some things in me that I didn't mm -hmm. necessarily see in myself <laughs> yeah. and I've always had leadership roles um, throughout my entire life and have always been very confident in doing what I believe I can. Um, but, you know, being able to actually take on the entire business yeah. is a different, it's a, it's, big, a, it's a total different big. thing. I now see, you know, why my father didn't come home some nights until midnight because he was so busy, you know, um, getting out those, those last minute orders, <laughs> right, you know, right. and um, structuring um, the right plans in order to grow the company. So, but taking on the family business is a, it's a, it's a different beast than working in it. Uh, would it have been possible that you could have uh, looked at your children and said, you know what? I'm not sure they, they, they can do this. Or did you always feel like it was your responsibility to make sure that they would be? Well, let me say this. When Elizabeth was a child, mm -hmm. being that my wife and I had five children, mm -hmm. okay, and she taught for, for DPS, mm -hmm. what I did each morning, I would take Elizabeth to school before I went to the office. Yeah, yeah. Okay? And at 2.30 every day when she was a child, I would pick her up. I would bring her home. Yeah. And at that time, we did have a big printing plant, and then I did have my main office there, but I kept an office at home. Okay. So when I picked her up, and she was, you know, she was only like about five years old, six yeah. years old. <laughs> I would go to my home office and start working, and start working. until my wife came in yeah. uh, around four o'clock. So Liz, uh, she was a baby, <laughs> and she would get on the chair and she would get on my back and <laughs> right. hug my back right. while like I'm while you're working while like I'm working. <laughs> so she was seeing how Daddy was working. Yeah. Yeah. Then from that point, like, uh, she got a piece of paper and a pen, and, and she wanted to actually mimic me right. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> on what I was doing. Yeah. Wow. Then she would fall asleep on the couch right yeah. behind my desk. <laughs> so um, she was... It's that kind of subtle... Exposed immersion, right? Yeah, uh, to a, a good yeah. work ethic. Yeah. It does. Mm -hmm. And my parents never forced us to do anything, yeah. literally. And um, one thing that I kind of want to touch back on when you were saying, um, how do you pass the business over to your, your children yeah. or your children's children? They right. truly have to be interested. They want to, they would have to want it. Absolutely. They would have to yeah. want it. Um, and in our family business, um, even though I am the CEO, um, the parents and the children have to understand that there's right. so many other roles within the company that, that are possible can, that you don't have to worry about just trying to fulfill a position parallel to yeah. what your parents had, right. but instead being in the business just in some capacity. Yes. Think about it. You have to hire an accountant. Yeah. You have to hire a cleaning yeah. company. You have yeah. to hire a VP. There's yeah. so many roles, but if you truly understand that, then that kind of you know softens yeah. the blow of what it mm -hmm. might be to take over a business. Yes. Well, yeah. we are out of time, but oh, uh, no. <laughs> thank you both for being here. This is really oh, wow, great. That was yeah. You're doing wonderful work in the community. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank okay. you. Oh, okay. Up next, a new bus tour highlights Detroit's black historic sites. But first, we continue our look back at this program over the last 50 years. Here's a clip from a 1996 American Black Journal episode featuring economist Dr. Claude Anderson. An alternative economic structure in the simplest form would be a Japan town, a little Korea, a little Italy, a little Havana which means where black folk would do exactly the same thing everyone else is doing. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone, the reason we never had an economic structure in the country for black folk is for, two, for three reasons. One, we never had a national plan to, and a commitment to do it. Two, is that, that whites are boycotting black communities and three, blacks are boycotting their own communities. And that's why you'll never see a white person get in his car, go down to a black neighborhood on a Saturday morning, get out and go into a black store and buy anything made by a black person. But neither will you see an Asians coming out of Chinatown, mm -hmm. going into a black community buying anything. 
everybody supports their own structure except black folk. We're the, that's why out of 36 million black folk, after 400 years in this country, you do not have one single solitary black business district in the entire United States. That is naivete, it is insulted, and it's grossly offensive to black folk because you're creating problems for yourselves by not belling up to the bar and accepting responsibility mm -hmm. of amassing wealth and capital, creating economic basis, creating an entrepreneurial class, creating mm -hmm. businesses, creating jobs that will hire your own people, uh, creating money to take care of your own public services, your lights, your gas, your how, streets. How do black people start doing all those things if 98% if, if of the wealth is in the hands of the white uh, power elite? Uh, we, 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 we started working that very simple. We start where we are. We, write, we are right now uh, amassing for, for disposable purposes something like about $380 billion annually. We're about the ninth richest nation on earth. But unfortunately, um, that money is dissipated through our fingers. A new bus tour of black historic sites in Detroit kicks off this month. The tour will stop at places designated by Michigan historical markers, such as the Motown Museum, Hart Plaza's Gateway to Freedom Monument, and the William V. Banks Broadcast Museum. It's hosted by the Black Historic Sites Committee of the Detroit Historical Society. Joining me now are Karen Hudson Samuels. She is vice chair of the committee, historian and tour guide Jamon Jordan, and Sharnay Sanders from the Detroit Historical Society. Thank you all for being Thank here. Um, uh, this is a wonderful idea, but it's not a new idea, and I know that because you and I are connected on social media, <laughs> yes, and I yeah. see you doing this all the time. Yes, right, so, right. so tell me what, uh, what's new about this. <laughs> well, what's great is that I'm partnering with yeah. the Black Historic Sites Committee. So I do tours mm -hmm. dealing with African-American historic sites in the city of Detroit. But this time I'm partnering with an, uh, an organization that's been around since 1971, working on these kinds of places and sites. And so I'm going to be leading a tour that anyone can join. Um, with the Black Historic Sites Committee to highlight the African-American history, particularly the sites dealing with African-American history in the city of Detroit. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and that's, uh, I mean, I don't know how you do that in, you have five hours set aside here. It seems like you could take five days uh, <laughs> to find the sites, all of the sites that are important. Well, you know, you're, you're right, Stephen, and coming up um, on June 9th, correct? June 16th. June 16th. 16th. Yeah. Correction. Mm -hmm. June 16th. Um, it's going to be unique because, as Jaman said, these are sites devoted to the people, places, and events of African Americans who've contributed to the history of Detroit, Michigan, yeah. and the nation. Mm -hmm. And so it's an opportunity to learn about the history from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And in between, with Jaman Jordan, who is a noted historian, mm -hmm. Even as we're going from site to site, we're also learning additional mm -hmm. information mm -hmm. that he shares. And in this day that we're in now, there are a lot of tours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are bus tours. There are all yeah. kinds of things. This one is very unique because it's fun. It tells you history. And... Um, Along the way, you get a stop at Burt's Parker Place. <laughs> right. I can't think of another tour that's going to take me there. <laughs> and talk about the Historical Society's uh, involvement in this. Yes, the Detroit Historical Society, we're so happy to have the Black Historic Sites Committee as one of our affinity groups. And the Black Historic Sites Committee, by far, is one of the most active affinity groups we have. And with the Black Historic Sites Committee, with like a mission to just continue to show people the contributions of African Americans in the city of Detroit with such a rich black history, mm -hmm. It's an amazing opportunity for us to work with them. And as Karen pointed out with this tour, it's great because the city is constantly changing with new projects and development. We need to make sure that the people really understand the history buried behind and that it's continued for sure not forgotten as we're moving forward. And I definitely feel like with this opportunity, it's a great way to get the entire family out and long-time Detroiters as well as new people that have just recently moved to the city that's curious to learn more about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, talk about some of the sites that are on the tour. Uh, I would imagine that some of them are places that people have heard of yes, or yes. maybe mm -hmm. seen before, but some of them are probably less familiar. Yeah, so the historical uh, monument that sits on the river, yeah. that's probably somewhat well known. Uh -huh. And of course Motown Museum is right. definitely Everybody. well known. Yeah. But there are other sites like the Dr. Ashen Sweet Home, mm -hmm. which is on the far east side of the city of Detroit on the corner of Garden and Charlevoix. Many people may not know, number one, the story of the Dr. Story, Ashen right. and Gladys Sweet and not know that that house 
is a, a historic site, yeah. an African American still historic sitting site, there, right? and still sitting there. Yeah. So that would be a site that people need to know about, need to know that struggle for housing, which of course is a prelude to some of the struggles that African Americans are still dealing with to this day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So a place like that, and of course another place, Fannie Richards' home site. Uh -huh. Fannie Richards, mm -hmm. the first African American public school teacher in the city of Detroit, mm -hmm. and her fight and her battle for equity in schools in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we're still talking about inequity in schools <laughs> in 2000. 18, but this is a long struggle, and yeah. people need to know that there's been a history of this struggle in the city of Detroit. It seems like people are more interested in this uh, mm -hmm. subject now than they have been, yes. and it's not just African Americans. That's true. Uh, That's true. I think a lot of white people are, right. are curious about this. Yes, and we, so we hope that everybody gets something out of this tour. Of course, African Americans we, we need to know some of the legacy of African Americans in the city of Detroit, mm -hmm. but everybody needs to know this history. Yeah. This is not history that only African Americans should know. Everybody needs to understand the contributions of African Americans in world history, in American history, but particularly Detroit. Here in history. Detroit? Yes, yeah. Yes. yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say, you're getting an insight into the, the kind of experience and history that you're going to learn from Jaman uh -huh. mm -hmm. because he's so well versed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. every site has. I've a, seen the video. <laughs> <laughs> every site has an additional backstory mm -hmm. um, that is, goes beyond just the, the marker itself, which is significant. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, and, and as Charnay kindly corrected me, on June 16th, that's right. We'll be leaving from the Detroit Historical. Museum uh -huh. at 1030. Uh, that's sharp to be there that's right. uh, mm -hmm. for, for the tour. Yeah. And people can go online to mm -hmm. uh, purchase a ticket. Right. And so we hope that they come out for an experience unlike any other. Sure. And we'll have more going forward in the future. So we're going to do this monthly. Um, you know, we've got tentative dates in, in July and August. And so uh, this is a very special way to learn about Detroit. You said new people are coming into the sure. city a lot of different ways That's right. that you can learn about the city. This, we think, is very special. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, I want to talk uh, briefly about something that I learned through you was mm -hmm. going on, that people were taking some of the markers uh, that, that, that highlight these spots. Yes. Uh, is that still happening? So in the last three years, we lost five historic African-American markers. Uh, we've replaced two. Yeah. So two ha are now back in place, mm -hmm. but we lost the William Lambert home site, one of the leaders of the Underground Railroad uh -huh. in the city of Detroit. Mm -hmm. Of course, we lost the Dunbar Hospital um, um, historical marker, which has been replaced. It hasn't yeah. been put back up, but at least it's been replaced. And we lost the um, meeting place for Frederick Douglass and John Brown at William Webb's home uh, site. Right. Um, so that one's been replaced as well. Yeah. As, as well as the Jewish historic site where the Bethel congregation was uh, founded, which right. was right next to that. So yeah. we've replaced some of those markers have been replaced, but we have not captured or caught anyone yeah. who's stealing these markers. And of course, one suspicion is about the metal. Uh, uh, the value metal, of the, the value uh, right. of scrap metal because right. they're made of aluminum but of course many of them were who have been many of the ones that have been removed have been african-american and jewish historic uh, yeah. sites so there's the, always that other that fear possibility that, that yeah. it could be something well else. and the danger of course is right. That's about trying to make people forget That's right. uh, That's instead history. of remember, which That's is right. the thing we need them uh, really to be doing. That's right. That's yeah. one of the objectives of the Black Historic Sites Committee mm -hmm. is to work on the replacement mm -hmm. um, of, those, of those missing, destroyed right. uh, markers, and one of them being Ralph Bunch. Yeah, yeah. That's That's right. right. Right, Ralph Bunch right. being the first person of color mm -hmm. in the United States to win mm -hmm. Nobel Peace the Prize. Nobel. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that, that along with others that... Um, as yeah. Jamon has said, have been replaced but not put up. But still, that's something one of our missions is to be attended to that and, yeah, and right. to make sure that they get replaced. Yeah. Uh, the, and the importance of this uh, being rooted in the historical society, I think, is also uh, notable because that's that reach outside mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. sort of traditional thought of right. what uh, Detroit history is. Exactly. Um, one of our newest directors of education, Brenda Tindo, she actually also mentions how the, the museum is really trying to become a museum without walls. Yeah. We're trying to get more into right. the neighborhoods get out, right? and get more, do that more of that outreach because we are, our passion and mission is telling Detroit stories and why they matter. And it's amazing with committees like the Black Historic Sites Committee 
that we're able to really do that because they help bring us more into the neighborhoods just so people really recognize the greatness and rich history that this city is made of and how it continues to push forward to today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, great job on the tours and maybe I'll be there. Yes, on the I, yes. Yes. Love to have I, I always see you on video. Yes. I've never done it in person. Yes. We'd love to have you. Yeah. Yeah. But thanks for, thanks for being yes. here. That's our program for today. Thanks for watching. You can get more information about our guests at AmericanBlackJournal.org and you can always connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. We'll see you next time. As American Black Journal looks ahead at the next 50 years, we want to hear from you, the viewers. Tell us what you think of this program and what you'd like to see on future episodes. Visit AmericanBlackJournal.org to take a quick survey and share your opinion. Thank you. American Black Journal is funded by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Ford has a long history of honoring the achievements of great men and women. We also recognize that honoring means ensuring their legacies are carried forward. 2018 marks the 50th anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination. To continue his legacy, Ford is partnering with the King Center and encouraging everyone to perform 50 acts of kindness. Between now and August 28th, go to mlk54.org and register your act of kindness. Add Ford in the group name as Ford will recognize select actions from our Southeast Michigan community. Perform your simple act of kindness and together we'll carry forward Dr. King's dream of creating a beloved community.